I think I should just be a drug dealer. What do you guys think? It's better money. More consistent for sure. That's what I'm saying. Less uh less finicky clientele. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to I'd Buy That for a Dollar, a podcast about inexpensive, common, and underappreciated records that are waiting to be rediscovered. I'm your host, Sean Hartman, and I technically would be a gold-certified podcast host if only I'd paid for the audit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if we had more Patreons, we'd uh, foot that bill for the audit, audit, Sean. Yeah, someday. Someday. A boy can dream. We'll get you certified. <laughs> Get a little plaque of your face on the wall. Yeah, and then I would imagine the audit could also tell me what I'm being certified gold for. That's the, the real mystery of it all, but someday. Yeah. Instead of like a gold record, it'd be like a gold iPhone in the little case. Perfect. I'll take it. Well, I'm co-host Jeremy, the Wild Thing Ruggles. <laughs> <laughs> that is what they call you. Because of my insane pitching prowess, <laughs> like from the movie Major League. Ah, quite the major leaguer. Nothing to do with this record. Yeah, I don't think we want Charlie Sheen getting anywhere near this record. <laughs> oh, that's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I am co-host Peter Cook. And I had considered going a Wild Thing Trogs route with my title, but I changed it at the last minute. Oh, uh, which direction did you go? I am Peter Cook, the Stranger and the Stranged. Oh. Uh, I like it. Am I the changer then and you're the changed? That may be the, that may be the case, Jeremy. Indirectly? Yeah. Why, why can't you be both, Jeremy? Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, think about it. What record are we going to talk about, guys? Chris Williamson, The Changer and the Changed. Oh, the folk rock record from 1975? That is the one oh. that I have brought this week. And I'm going to just kick it off with Waterfall, the first track on the album. Nothing to do with TLC, because it's singular, not plural. True. Sometimes it takes a rainy day Just to let you know Everything's gonna be
I really like that track as an album opener. I feel like so often the first track is supposed to be like the hit or the up-tempo song to get people hooked or something like that. And this one, it takes a while to build. It's kind of long. It's a full six minutes. It goes a lot of unexpected directions. And I think in a lot of ways, it really sets the tone for the rest of the record and gives you like little glimpses of things they're going to explore more as the album goes on. Yeah, there's a pretty wide range of tones, feelings, emotions on this record. And, you know, from song to song, that one might be the most diverse within one song. It's great use of dynamics, starting so Mm -hmm. subdued, melancholy, quiet, and then slowly, as you said, gradually building to this much more kind of euphoric sound. And a lot of the changes are like a little funkier than you might expect too. Like it obviously never goes into like full on funk or dance territory, but there's some, there's some groove going on. Yeah. Yeah. It reminded me a bit of Carol King. Valid. Yeah. That, that was a, an instant comparison that I made while getting into this record for sure. But it's definitely different too. And it's more of a lo-fi indie ordeal. <laughs> it is an indie, indie ordeal. <laughs> More on that later, though. Yeah. We'll get there. Cool your jets there, Peter. All right. Just trying to jump into all the cool factoids here. First, I just got to rub in that I brought a record that I think neither of you had heard but prior to this, correct? I have seen it around. Ah. And I think I've even like bought and sold a few copies, but I have never listened to it. So, oh, all right. Yeah. You st- uh, this still counts. I'll yeah. give this one to you yeah, for I, sure. I wasn't familiar with this at all. And, and it's a fantastic record. I really love it. Yeah, I'm, I'm proud of this one because it was a very instinctual buy. I was in an antique store in my old job, and the title of the album caught me. I was like, mm-hmm. oh, that's, that's some good wordplay there. And I'm looking at the cover, and it's this lady in her overalls in Joshua Tree, which is like one of my favorite places that I've been on Earth. So I was like, oh, you got me twice. And I like pop it out and look at the back, and it doesn't like all the indications are this is not a major release. And I'd never heard of Olivia Records. And there's also a list that's like, Thank you to these people. And then there's a list of like 50 people. And I'm looking through it and I'm like, these are all women on this list. Mm -hmm. So I became very intrigued by what was on it. But I was like out in the sticks. So I couldn't like uh, look it up on my phone and I was working and stuff. So I'm like, I'm just going to buy it. Take it with me. Figure it out on the back end. Yeah, the old fashioned way. The old fashioned way. And uh, now it's here on the podcast. Yeah. Sometimes that instinct falls flat and sometimes you end up with a new favorite record. True. And this is a very interesting record to me. It's, uh, as you put, it's like indie sounding. Yeah. An indie. I think I meant to say affair, not ordeal, but you know. (laughs) (laughs) True. And that's because it is independent. Yeah, in 1975. 1975, and this record was the best-selling independent record up until like the early 90s when there were more independent records. And they were just selling CDs too. Let's be real. Yeah. This might be the best-selling independent vinyl of all time, realistically. Ooh. Yeah, it's entirely possible. I heard that it was almost certified gold. (laughs) <laughs> oh yeah, I guess we should explain that since you used it in your title. It's believed that this has sold like 500,000 copies, half a million, which would certify it as gold. But for reasons that will become more obvious later, Olivia Records did not pay to get the record certified. You have to like pay some auditing company that verifies that that many people bought it or whatever, blah, blah, blah. Super boring. 
But it well that I didn't understand that until we were talking on our Jackson's episode about how Motown wasn't getting their stuff certified. You know, even though it was selling millions of copies, I was I didn't realize that if, if they always use that word certified platinum. I didn't realize it was this whole auditing process that you have to pay for as the, the record company. So obviously, an independent label isn't going to foot the bill for something like that. Yeah, yeah, just someone else's hustle. Yep. Getting certified, uh, whatever. Well, let me tell you a little more about Chris Williamson so you know where this record is coming from. Yeah. And we'll go to the beginning. Chris Williamson, 1947, born in Deadwood, South Dakota. She actually grew up mostly, though, in Colorado. And her dad was a park ranger. And she spent many years of her childhood without electricity. It looks like she's in like a national park on the cover. Yeah, it's <laughs> Joshua Tree National Park. Oh, is that? That's Joshua Tree. Okay. Yeah, you can tell by the Joshua Trees behind her. Yeah. <laughs> Which a lot of people probably don't know. That's the only place on earth that those trees grow Ooh. is in Joshua Tree National Park. So well, thank you for that. Bit of a little bit of fact, national park factoid. Factoid. So she grew up without electricity and would actually listen to music as a child on a wind up phonograph. Very, it draws like a almost comically old timey image in my mind of like being in a cabin with a little wind up phonograph, but it's actually like the 50s. Yeah. Well past the period of the phonograph. Yeah. The wind-up phonograph. Yeah. And I read some interviews, but she didn't talk much about her early, like, when she started music kind of stuff that presumably, if we've listened to the podcast, we know that everyone started in church choirs, but (laughs) I don't know where she actually picked up music, but I do know that... By the age of 16, she put out her first album that was funded. She was playing on a local radio station in Sheridan, Wyoming, and some listeners actually gathered the money together to record her, and they recorded her in the radio station and made her first album that was like a pressing of 500 records. Yeah, like... Super limited run. Yeah. She sold those. And that was uh that was the artistry of Chris Williams Williamson? Yeah. From sixty four. Sixty four. Oh, well over a decade before this album. Yeah, this album is actually her fifth album, I guess technically. That was actually only her second like true studio album because She went on to record two more albums in the manner of this first album, just in this radio station. It was either all covers or mostly covers. I think they were all covers, though, of folk songs. I'm guessing those aren't ones you're going to find in a dollar bin. No. Those (laughs) sell for, like, hundreds of dollars online if you have one even, which only 500 people do. (laughs) <laughs> if that yeah i was, I was just that. seeing that uh those first three early ones are like impossible to find nearly and quite expensive but also i just want to note real quick that her record from 1971 a self-titled album has a song called shine on straight arrow that dilla sampled yeah later on i saw that like a 2003 album yeah it's the the dilla mad lib collaboration record champion sound nice yeah. So that was from her first like true studio album. It was just self-titled 1971 and the album right before the one we're, we are talking about today. I want to play another song though before we dip further into this album in particular. Yeah. So I want to jump to one of the ones I like most on here, Sweet Woman. Yeah, this one is phenomenal really album highlight for sure yeah it's been bringing my spirits up the last couple days in this bleak michigan weather winter weather oh yeah it's snowing 
uh, heavily outside to set the scene for our listeners. Yeah. Gray. And then you hear just a piece of audio candy such as this. Sweet Woman, Chris Williamson. Something dawned on me when I was listening to that song earlier today. 1975, if that song had been written by a man, he would have used the word girl. <laughs> ah, true. <laughs> yeah, it probably would have been like sweet little girl or sweet yeah. little woman at the very least. <laughs> yeah, yep. It would have been something to kind of create a, a hierarchy in the relationship dynamic, but that feels very equal. Yeah. And maybe to not just jump over the like obvious thing there, it's a woman singing about being in love with another woman, which I like maybe to our ears in these modern times, like doesn't even trigger anything of like, Oh, that's unusual in any manner. But in 1975, that was, just wildly out of line <laughs> unheard of yeah you know, i got goosebumps when i realized what was happening there and it's such a great song too yeah and yeah it's a beautiful song with some i like the, the harmonic movement going on there and then all of a sudden it's like country <laughs> yeah and once again that one pretty wide dynamic range and changes within it as well so the, both the first song we played in that one are great examples of the range of the record. And then I think a lot of the other songs are a little more evenly toned throughout. Agreed. Well, let's, uh, let's move a little closer to this album and its uh, creation here. So she releases her first true studio album in 1971. And 1973... Chris Williamson was brought on to be interviewed on the radio by Meg Christian. And they got to talking about the music industry and how, you know, if you couldn't tell, it's all run by men. Mostly still is. But <laughs> in that time, there's literally no women in the music industry running things. Mm hmm. So they got to talking, and Chris was like, we should just start a label run by women. And 
then the next day they did. <laughs> Meg was pretty tied into the DC area lesbian scene at that time. And it was her, Chris, and eight other women borrowed money essentially to put out initially a single that they had Chris on one side and Meg on the other. They sold enough copies of that to fund their first full-length album, which was Meg's album. And then that album sold well enough to fund Chris's album, which is this album we're listening to in 1975. And as we mentioned before, this album went on to sell half a million copies. Yeah, well beyond their expectations, I'm sure. Yeah, it's just mind-boggling in that era to sell that many independently created records. Were you able to find any information as to why it would have been selling that well? I mean, I know it's a great record, obviously, but a lot of great records didn't sell, especially I have to think that this didn't have like major label promotion backing. Yeah. Was it getting played on station, radio stations in key areas? Not especially. So from what I could gather, this, I mean, Olivia was the, Olivia Records, the label they started, was the first women-run record label. And it was in part of this movement that is what we refer to now as second wave feminism Mm -hmm. that started in the 60s. And by this time, it's starting to get more into like the popular conscience. People are talking about feminism, talking about some of the issues involved. But more importantly, for the sale of the records, there are women bookstores that are centered around selling feminist literature. There are women festivals that are starting to pop up, including I found the longest running one was here in Michigan, the Michigan's Women's Festival that ran for 40 years from 1976 until 2015. Until pretty recently. Yeah, I was... (laughs) Uh, Surprise, I had not heard of it, but they kind of went down. I mean, it sort of parallels the fall of Olivia Records, which was earlier, but the reason Michigan Women's Festival ended, it was a festival where only women were allowed in, but they took a stance of being trans-exclusionary. So women who were not women by birth or not invited into the festival, which that uh, does not jive with present times and our no. thoughts on gender. So it kind of, it's like a victim of its own success in a way. Mm-hmm. Like they pushed progress forward, but then they didn't continue with that progress. And I feel like that's kind of where Olivia Records also went. That may be foreshadowing too far ahead, but... Well, I'm intrigued. Continue. Well, let's mention the players on this record, who are, as you may have guessed, all women. Mm Mm-hmm. You got Chris Williamson is playing the guitar, obviously, and also the piano on the record. Okay, I was wondering if that was her as well. It was. You got Jacqueline Robbins on bass. Margie Adam on keyboards, who was also an artist on Olivia Records. Jacqueline Furman on percussion. June Millington on guitar. Oh, wow. June Millington from the band Fanny. From Fanny. Okay, nice. She's major. Fantastic guitar player. Yeah. And then on backup vocals, you have uh, a handful of other Olivia Records artists, as mentioned, Meg Christian and Holly Near and Vicky Randall, who all put out music with Olivia Records as well. Yeah, I thought that was really cool when I looked at the personnel and it dawned on me that, and it's you know not just the players, the engineers, the people doing the artwork. It's all women. Yeah, yeah, and the actually the engineer on this album received death threats from. 
lesbian separatists because the engineer was a trans woman and they the separatists felt was not truly a woman and should not be working with Olivia Records. So damn. Yeah, it's a complicated history where that was another thing I wanted to kind of mention is the scene that Olivia Re- Records was birthed out of was reactionary to the counterculture movement of the 60s, which was seen by them as too heteronormative. Mm -hmm. And that kind of created this other scene that was in reaction to that. And then later on, you get reactions to that scene. And I guess that's how progress happens. Yeah, (laughs) it truly is. There's always within a movement there's something that could be improved and you know it takes people coming along like great ideas but this is this isn't jiving so well (laughs) yeah 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 and olivia records took some criticism for that they were i mean the majority of the music being put out was white middle class lesbians so they actually did make some effort in the 80s to include African-American lesbians in some of their releases. But at that point, uh, second wave feminism kind of as a larger movement was already, I don't know, fizzling out. I mean, it was facing the Reagan era, mm-hmm. which was a backlash against anything resembling progress. <laughs> yes. And that sort of fractured out, I would say, into third wave feminism in the 90s. Mm -hmm. But this isn't a podcast about the history of feminism, so (laughs) I digress. Mm -hmm. So let's jump to the song that is my namesake, Wild Things. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Things, plural. Oh, I'm really focusing on singular and plural on this episode for some reason. (laughs) That's what I appreciate about you, Peter. (laughs) All right. Let's hear Wild Things. Side A, track three. I found it very telling of your style, Jeremy, that that was your 
selection you you would have chose that one i definitely would have gone with the song of the soul that has the kids singing on it uh. <laughs> but i had a feeling there was no way that you would include that on <laughs> when it's your episode you're right i went with the slow. i do like that song i like that song a lot as well and that is uh seemingly the most popular song from this record the, the song of the soul. song of the soul yeah, yeah. Well, it's just so upbeat and cheery and hopeful, whereas this one that Jeremy played is very slow and melancholy like me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it, but it's a great song. Yeah. Yeah, it is a great song. And it reminded me again while we were listening just now to mention how good her voice is. Yeah, we should definitely mention that. Her voice is good. <laughs> I like it when the singing's good. Yeah. Very, I think you mentioned it as far as the dynamics of the instruments and kind of the songs within it, but she also just singularly with her voice just like can really push and have that powerful thing, but also pull it back to almost a whisper to fading away, but with like perfect control while doing it. Mm -hmm. There were times on this album where you know we've obviously mentioned the carol king and you said i think you didn't say this on mic but uh while we were listening to one of the songs that judy collins is also like one of her main inspirations yeah. but even artists like buffy saint marie and in some cases artists who would have come later who would have maybe have been inspired by her like ani defranco oh yeah mm -hmm. i have to imagine ani defranco was aware and inspired by her yeah and in a lot of ways this sounds like an indie album from the late 90s or early to mid 2000s yeah <laughs> to like 20 30 years ahead of the oh yeah that's <laughs> another thing i should probably mention this album was recorded in like a church studio like a far-right church that just like let them use it and chris williamson herself produced it who she had never produced a record before this. They had some legit engineers, so the the quality is good, but like the production choices, I I think you get that indie feel from because it's someone's like personal choices. It's not pro professionals trying to make a great pop mix that'll come through nice on the radio. Yeah, and this edition is a second edition. It's a reissue from shortly after the original one that says remixed for better sound on the front. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't have the full story on that. I, I don't know what the first edition was, but they apparently felt the need to remix it again. <laughs> yeah. For better sound for the second edition. I thought that was interesting. Sean, do you, are you going to interject with the details that you said on the, uh... <laughs> uh, yeah. Jumping back to a reference from earlier in the episode, uh, Jeremy had said that, the label was trying to add more black musicians on the records. And I've heard one of the other Meg Christian records before, um, an album called Face the Music that came out in 77. And I noticed I'm looking at that, that has uh, background vocals by one of my favorite dollar bin groups, uh, a group called Sweet Honey in the Rocks. That was like a acapella gospel vocal group that is always fun to find it's it's fun to see the connection in um, some of these different early 70s you know pioneering feminist groups and seeing uh, some collaboration even if they didn't get everything right like we talked about but always like connecting the dots with music like that yeah and jeremy mentioned that uh june millington is on this june millington is filipino american well i didn't know that I believe that all three members of Fanny were also part of the LGBTQ community as well. Okay. I didn't realize that. Yeah. So that's this album. It's good. All the other songs are good. A lot of them that I didn't play, as Peter mentioned, are more upbeat. And reading interviews with Chris, it seemed like that was important to her to not... It seems like she was very against pretension including like far out jazz and like overly complicated modern classical things. She saw those things as isolating 
and wanted to create music that everyone could enjoy. You know, she created this music, you know, by women and with the intention of expressing the female experience. However, she wanted it to be able to appeal to everyone and for everyone to be able to enjoy aspects of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's quite accessible. Yeah, yeah, it's like sophisticated-ish. Like it's not dumb pop level. (laughs) Yeah. But it's not like so far out that it's not accessible, as you said. Mm -hmm. It's not like a Laurie Anderson record or something. No. She continued making records and still continues making records to this day and is still out there playing shows Uh, i'm not sure how recently though with all the covid stuff but olivia records actually converted to a travel agency in 1990 (laughs) and from what i could tell still operates as such for like women's only cruises is their kind of primary things and like yeah, get-togethers of that nature. So Olivia Records is no more. Olivia Travel Company or whatever it's called <laughs> still out there. Is it in any way related to the Olivia Tremor Control? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> wow. We brought up some Elephant 6 band. Yeah, yeah uh, I think that might be a very male-dominated record label. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> Yeah, that's uh, that's Chris. So, as you find, do you have any albums you'd recommend, Sean? I do. So I've decided to debut a slight change to uh, how we talk about the accompanying playlists that I make every week. For those of you that don't enjoy the word salad of lists of musicians, um, I'm going to shorten it to three to five recommended albums and i'll tell you a little bit about why it's recommended what songs on the playlist and then you can just figure out the rest of the playlist songs on your own yeah the playlist will still be the great lengthy diverse amalgamation that they've been but yeah the talking portion will be shorter especially when i'm not explaining it further from what sean said (laughs) (laughs) All right, so let's let's give it a shot here. First up on the recommended albums is the self-titled album by The Roaches from 1979. And I put the song Hammond Song, which was a hit of theirs, mm. on the playlist. Peter, I know you're a fan, right? Oh, yes. I just picked up a copy of that album at Vertigo in Grand Rapids for five bucks. Nice. And Yeah, it's easy to find. It's around for sure. And produced by Robert Fripp. So that that song in particular has some fantastic Robert Fripp guitar work on it, but their harmonies, it's just the best blood harmony, the roaches. Yeah. And I thought the vocal style in general was pretty reminiscent of this. So if you, if you like the vocals and the dynamic, especially on this album, definitely check out the roaches. I think eventually we'll cover them. We might have to have Taylor Rowley come on for that one. Yeah, doing the roaches definitely seems like an inevitable pick, along with hundreds of other great dollar bin records that we have teased <laughs> about doing an episode about. <laughs> Next up on the list, uh, Judy Collins' Wildflowers from 1967. As Jeremy mentioned, Judy Collins was Chris's favorite singer, and you can really tell the influence from that record in particular. I kind of always thought of Judy Collins as a straightforward folk musician, but when you dig into some of these records, There's like a classical influence to it. There's a lot of orchestration and just really interesting changes going on. I put the song Since You Asked on the playlist, and that's another one that's very, very easy to find in the dollar bin. Yeah, she helped popularize some songs in America that might have not really reached us. Otherwise, like who knows where the time goes by Fairport Convention. People of the, you know, the baby boomers, they all know that song from Judy Collins' version. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, next up is an artist that we have put on a few playlists and mentioned a handful of times, but still have not done a record by Laura Nero. I put the song Poverty Train from her 1968 album Eli and the 13th Confession. I had read earlier that Laura Nero is also a member of the LGBTQ community. Okay. 
Anne mentioned on our very first and, episode of the podcast because she lived with Jimmy Spheris. Yeah, and Laura's Laura's also a great example of the crossover between pop and soul music in a kind of a Carol King vibe as well. Stone Soul Picnic. Mm-hmm. There's a cover of that on that same record, mm-hmm. Eli and the Thirteenth Confession. And then I put one bonus uh, fourth pick on here. This is another one that's really, really easy to find in a dollar bin and has a whole interesting and very tragic story associated with it that I won't get into today, but The Singing Nun from 1963. That is by the artist whose real name is Jean-Paul Marie Deckers. She had a, a hit with the song Dominique, which you can find on that, but it's a really, really cool, mostly solo guitar and vocals and is a, a very important record in the history of LGBTQ women performing music. Definitely worth checking out. And again, you can find that very easy at pretty much any thrift store. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one I've seen. I I don't really know the whole story behind it. So I can't wait to hear more about it eventually on possibly on this podcast, Sean. It's entirely possible. (laughs) (laughs) And real quick, there's a, there's a bunch of artists that we've talked about before on the show that are good recommendations. Uh, Melanie, Joan Arma Training, Dusty Springfield, who we've mentioned many times, and Carol King as well. Uh, Janice Ian is another one that we've talked about before that I think is a good parallel. Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. So it's an all-women playlist, and where can we find it, Sean? That is on Spotify. Just search I'd Buy That Podcast, all one word, to find this and every other of our playlists. Fantastic. Fantastic. Fantastic voyage. That was a fantastic voyage, I'd say. <laughs> I'd say that was a fantastic voyage. You know where else you can find a fantastic voyage? Uh, on a where? lakeside album? Olivia Travel Agency. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. I, sw- I swear they're not paying me. <laughs> like a so pro. do we have any other songs that we want to listen to to close out this episode? or? Yeah, I'm going to send them off on a song. All right. It's going to be a really upbeat, cheery song, right? <laughs> With a children's chorus and yeah. all the things that Jeremy loves. No. I'm going to play One of the Light for the last track that you will hear until you go get one of these records yourself. Keep your eye out there. If you see a, you know, a record that seems like this, this doesn't fit the mold of what they were doing in that era check it out and maybe you'll stumble upon a whole movement like women's music and a whole story that kind of got confined back to history because it's not the current movement but um yeah it's very interesting and there's a lot of good art associated with it yeah, I'm especially surprised that you you know you just took a chance on this one, and it turned out to be one that there's ample copies of out there too. Yeah, yeah, that surprised me. <laughs> I didn't realize I was buying the best selling independent record in, until the '90s. Yeah, yeah, I this is all new to me, and thank you, Jeremy. This is a fantastic album. I will be continuing to listen to it, especially the Kitty song. Oh my god, I'm going to skip that one still. (laughs) Well, I think we've done what we need to do for today here at I'd Buy That for a Dollar. Thank you so much for your listenership. My name is Peter Cook. I'm Sean Hartman. And I'm Sham Hartman. No, I'm still Jeremy Ruggles. That was a callback to another episode in case that's confusing and you didn't listen to that other episode. Go back to Johnny Nash. Go back to Johnny Nash if you want to understand that joke. Listen to an hour-long podcast if you want to understand this joke. It won't pay off. (laughs) Well, it will pay off in that you'll learn about Johnny Nash and early reggae in America. But And if you want to further hear Jeremy do a call back to that you can sign up for our patreon at patreon.com slash i buy that podcast well done peter (laughs) okay i'm jeremy i'm out of here